Hello, lovely listener. My name is Lindsay, and you're listening to Two Cents Podcast, your Audible anthology. This is the first episode where I'll be talking about the beauty of poetry analysis, and I describe the essence of the episode with Robert Frost's words: "Poetry begins in delight, and ends in wisdom. Simple, yet powerful." Without further ado, cue the intro. In preparation for this episode, I watched a couple of TED talks to get the latest perception of poetry. One was by a poetry critic, and the other by an acclaimed slam poet. Stephen Burt, the critic, mentions the timeless truth that is everyone's mortality. However, poetry delivers this knowledge in coupled hands. In most cultures, coupled hands are a symbol of respect and diligence. These attributes can be seen in the way that poetry can navigate human experience, taking milestones both great and small, and even the prosaic things in a person's life and handling them diligently, which is a demonstration for the respect of human life. Seeing that it is worth making poetry out of it. The talk given by the slam poet titled "Poetry Makes People Nervous" focuses on toning down the high-flown connotation of poetry that sometimes makes it repulsive because it may come off as pretentious and at times confusing. I enjoyed the talk because of the speaker's down-to-earth approach. She maintained her passion for this art and really sought to pass it on to others. So the essence of her talk was her likening the making of a poem to bodily expulsion. It was quite humorous and though somewhat obscene, she made a great point with her analogy. A poem resides in all of us. Essentially, we all have the means for poetic expression. How we get it out, so to say, is a is an individual story. Her message extends what I'd call the wingspan of poetry. that it is an ability native to us from primitive chants all the way to the libraries of anthologies we presently have you could say that poetry is innate as i mentioned poetry has a special way of perceiving human experiences milestones and the prosaic two poems i describe to these experiences would be john kinsella's lament for mrs mary moore by w b yeats and squatter children by elizabeth bishop yeats's poem which i'd categorize as a milestone poem reads a bloody and sudden end gunshot or a noose for death takes what man would keep and leaves what man would lose he might have had my sister my cousins by the score but nothing satisfied the fool but my dear mary moore none other knows what pleasures man at table or in bed what shall i do for pretty girls now my old board is dead though stiff to strike a bargain like an old jew man her bargain struck we laughed and talked and emptied many a can and oh but she had stories though not for the priest's ear to keep the soul of man alive banish age and care and being old she put a skin on everything she said what shall i do for pretty girls now my old board is dead the priests have got a book that says but for adam's sin eden's garden would be there and i there within no expectation fails there no pleasing habit ends no man grows old no girl grows cold but friends walk by friends who quarrels over half pennies that plucks the trees for bread what shall i do for pretty girls now my old board is dead all right so the poem is about a man john kinsella who is lamenting over a mrs mary moore 
I couldn't find much about these two characters in my research, but there was an actress, Mary Moore, who died in the same decade that the poem was written. From what I read about her, she was certainly an inspiration for what she achieved as a woman in her time. But I won't assume that she is the Mary Moore in the poem, because how she died is different from the death mentioned in the poem. I think this poem describes the compulsory milestone that is one's death. The speaker reminisces a lot and describes all the things that he and Mary would do and talk about. And at the end of each stanza, he repeats, What shall I do for pretty girls? Now my old board is dead. What I find weirdly heartwarming about these lines is a board, spelt B-A-W-D, is a lewd person, someone who is vulgar, and the speaker calls the deceased his old board, which takes this derogatory term and turns it into a term of endearment for his loved one. It separates Mary from the pretty girls because of how profane she is in comparison to them. Now that she is gone, the speaker wonders what business would any pretty girl want to have with him when the only girl who ever really understood him is gone. This marks the end of her life and subtly describes the displacement he feels now that she's gone. It all began with the delight of nostalgia, thinking back on the fun memories, and ended with the knowledge that death is permanent. When someone is dead, the memories are what mostly stay behind, and the feelings of displacement aren't regular, but they're just part of it. My take on a prosaic poem would be Elizabeth Bishop's Squatter Children, of which I will read the first two stanzas. On the unbreathing sides of hills they play, a speck-like girl and boy, alone but near a speck-like house. The sun's suspended eye blinks casually, and then they wade, the gigantic waves of light and shade. A dancing yellow spot, a pup, attends to them. Clouds are piling up. A storm piles up behind the house. The children play at digging holes. The ground is hard. They try to use one of their father's tools. A mattock with a broken shaft. The two of them can scarcely lift. It drops and clangs. Their laughter spreads. Effulgence in the thunderheads. A beautiful excerpt. So, this poem is from Bishop's collection titled Questions of Travel, which includes poems dedicated to her travels in Brazil. During her stay, she noted her experiences as a foreigner, as we see in this narration of the favelas in Rio de Janeiro, that she describes as the unbreathing sides of hills because of how close they are built to each other. Due to the congestion, the sides of the hill are completely covered, and hence unbreathing. Bishop then touches on what she sees at that very moment. Children playing in the waning sun, making up games by digging up holes and playing with pets. She witnesses an everyday thing, but tells a story about communal living and society at large. As a result, her, writing st her style of writing and use of diction is what makes this piece a gem. She's able to capture the vibrancy of life in the favelas and yet resounds the reality of poverty that consumes the environment. If you've noticed, I'm sure you can tell that poems have impartable delight and that there's always a resounding note of wisdom that etches itself unto you. Remember the poetry critic I mentioned at the beginning? Yes. So, as a literary critic, he is inclined to dismantle poetry in order to understand how it works, either in pursuit of a truth, perspective, or unearthing a technique. Analysis, the act of purposeful dismantling, is what brings out the fragrance of a piece, and it matters because it can change, 
strengthen or weaken perceptions and even beliefs. It's powerful and I think a necessary accomplice when delving into poetry. An example that's pretty dear to me is a poem by Edwin Bodney titled When a Boy Tells You He Loves You. Revisiting it brings back so many memories as I had recited slash acted it out for an I Stedford in high school. I first watched it being recited by Bodney himself on YouTube. He delivered it with so much power and control in his voice. It felt personal and was just astounding. Mine is a, was a far cry from his delivery, but the poem was special enough to inspire. The excerpt I will be reading to you is the bit I will also be analyzing. When a boy tells you he loves you, you will hear music. The voice of your past lovers dancing up your throat. Your stomach in after hours cabaret still waiting on the last call. That was when you learned that when a boy says I love you, he means I am getting ready to be inconsistent with you now. This boy will tell you that he loves you not long after he had you waiting for two hours in front of a cocktail lounge. Patience is something you are working on. But no, not for him. When he asks you to tell him that you love him back, you will be in a car in the parking lot of a late night diner. You will watch the words fall into your lap like a spilled glass of white wine. You will remember the day your courier pigeon heart got lost in the wind because that was a message it did not know how or where to carry. Alrighty, so the speaker describes the sensations that are evoked when a boy tells you he loves you. The sound of music and the voices of past lovers at your throat, it seems like it's melodious yet discomforting along with your stomach in after-hours cabaret, which could be a great alternative for butterflies as you wait for the last call. These sensations reveal the intent behind these words. The boy has no intention to be consistent and will use these words to bind the wounds he causes with his inconsistencies. From this excerpt, we see that the recipient of these words is either stuck alone or waiting stuck with their own thoughts in the parking lot of a late night diner or cocktail lounge to handle this half done request for redemption. This recipient is obviously overwhelmed with these words and Bodney creates such a beautiful image with this feeling when he refers to the heart as a courier pigeon. In receiving the words, I love you, the courier pigeon heart is so perplexed that it ends up getting lost in the wind because the boy's inconsistencies, alongside his declaration of love, are starkly opposed to each other, which is an unpleasant battle in the mind of the recipient as they try to reconcile these two things. I find a great deal of delight in Bodney's lyrical style. He illustrates such astonishing images. With that, he delivers the truth about the harm of a toxic relationship in a truly dignified way. I'm sure you can notice a trend here. The light and wisdom. These two things aren't qualifiers for a good analysis or poem, but they are significant. I would think that that's how poems stick because they give you either delight or wisdom, or both. So, to recap, poetry is innate, and we've used it for ages. Therefore, you are capable of poetic expression. And analysis matters. Now, I'll say it again. In the words of Robert Frost, poetry begins in delight and ends in wisdom. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you got something from this. Honestly speaking, my schedule is still in shambles. But in case you'd like to join me again for another episode, I'd appreciate a follow on the podcast Instagram at 2 cents PNF 
and a subscription to the podcast's YouTube channel where dates and times will be posted. But don't worry, the moment I have a proper schedule, I'll let you know. All videos mentioned will be linked and if you'd like a bit more, you can check out the mini blog post on my website where I discuss the episode cover art. Till next time.